We love our Sony cameras. They do require a lot of customization for the way that we work with them. Some of the things that we do are unusual, so they might not apply to you, but I thought I'd walk through and, and show you the various customizations that we've made to uh, our variety of Sony cameras. I'm gonna be focusing on the, the A7R2 and the Sony A6000, because those kind of show the different body types. Uh, and in general, it should apply to just about every camera out there. If you want a full tutorial on how to use the Sony cameras, check out sdp.io slash tutorials. We have tutorials for just about every modern camera there, including Sony cameras. It'll show you the various buttons and dials and such. This is more like uh, uh, customized and advanced than that. First of all, we definitely shoot raw on these cameras, and I, I've tried both ways. I generally prefer the benefits of shooting compressed raw over the newly available uncompressed raw. The uncompressed raw, in theory, gives you a little bit better quality, especially in areas of super high contrast that you might experience in night photography. But I'd been shooting with the compressed raw forever and never had any problems with it. So when they released the update that supported uncompressed raw, I was like, I'm just gonna keep doing it. Save myself a little bit of storage. I'll show you how I customize the FN menu on this camera because th this is one of the most important things. They provide, Sony provides you with this quick menu. So I'll hit the FN key here, the function key, and all the cameras have something like this. And it brings up just, well, whatever they think you should be using, but I tend to adjust it to the settings that I change on a regular basis because I hate, hate digging through the menu system. So the first one I use here is to switch between the Sh the shutter speed. So I have it on continuous high now and I'll, I'll pop it open anytime I want to use like a two second delayed shutter if I'm putting the camera on a tripod and I want to eliminate the effect of camera shake from pushing the button. Or uh, this is the same option I'd use for bracketing or taking multiple photos. Um, so it's, it's a really useful thing to have at your fingertips. On the A7R2, it has a silent shooting mode. So I have that as my second option there. I'll use silent shooting you know, if, if you're shooting uh, in a church or a wedding or something, you don't want to disturb anybody or you're doing street photography, silent shooting can be really useful. It, it uses the electronic shutter, which can introduce some artifacts like rolling shutter if there's action or something. But I like silent shooting a lot and I, I frequently turn it on and off. The third option here isn't available now. It's the steady shot focal length. So, so this particular camera, the A7R2, as well as the A7S2 and the A7 Mark II, they all have steady shot inside, which stabilizes the sensor by moving it to cancel out camera shake. If you have this and you use uh, manual focus lenses like this Metacon 50 millimeter F095, um, you will have to tell the camera what the focal length of the lens is. So I am often switching between these manual focus lenses and I have to go in and set it to 50 millimeters or 200 millimeters or whatever it is. So I frequently do that I hate digging through the menu, so I put it as a third option on the function menu. The fourth one here is the focus mode. And I almost always will leave that as AFS, single shot AF, because that seems to be the most reliable. Um, but sometimes I will need to switch to continuous autofocus for different things, so I like to have it at my fingertips. The fourth option here is the focus area. I, I have it set here, but I also have that set to a keyboard shortcut. That just allows me to move the focusing point around when I need to. And the, the sixth option, because we use this as a video camera, I have the picture profile set. I can set this and then quickly switch over to one of the picture profiles that uses S-Log3 to give me a greater dynamic range for the sake of video. But I will also change the picture profile when I'm shooting stills because sometimes I want to shoot in black and white and uh, changing the picture profile will allow me to see it in black and white. And um, that just helps me visualize it. The next option here is smile face detection, and I'll, I'll usually leave that on, but it can get irritating at times, so I like to be able to turn it on and off quickly. Uh, the second from the, the left on the bottom row here, I have set to focus peaking. And focus peaking is really, really useful if you are manually focusing or if you're using video. It'll just highlight parts of the picture that are contrasty enough to be in focus. So I, I, I like to be able to turn it on or off and to adjust it. I normally have focus peaking set to low, but I can set it to high or something or turn it off completely when it gets to be too annoying. And then the next option here is peaking color. Um, right now I have it set to yellow, but sometimes I'll be photo photographing yellow flowers or something and I'll go be able to go in and, and quickly set that to a different color that provides a little more contrast. Um, the other options, I don't really need those all those spots. So that's how I've customized my function menu to actually customize your function menu, hit the menu button 
this can be in a different place than some of the other cameras, but on the A7R2, it's, it's on the gear option and then page seven. So in, on the A6000, it might be on a different page, but it's gonna be somewhere under the gears and it's gonna say function menu set. And then you can go in and set function upper one, two, three, four, five, six, function lower one, two, three, four, five, six. Now let's talk about back button focus. I, I love back button focus. And if you haven't used back button focus, check our channel. There's a whole video about why it's good. Basically, back button focus decouples focusing from the shutter button. So you push the shutter button down halfway, the camera doesn't focus. Instead, I have focus linked to this button on the back. So when I want it to focus, I'll push that and it will pop into focus. What this allows me to do is to get my focus set on a scene and then take multiple pictures without refocusing because sometimes when the camera does autofocus, it can be a little frustrating. It might hunt back and forth and it can delay me shooting a few seconds. So the ability to, to push the shutter button without requiring it to focus, I find it to be really helpful on all my cameras. To set that, uh, you have to change two settings. So I'll hit the menu button here on the gear menu. On the A7R2, it's on page five. On the other cameras, it might be on a different page. And so I'll go down here and then AF with shutter. This is set to on by default. You want to set that to off. That means it won't autofocus when you push the shutter. Next, you need to assign autofocusing to some other button so you can still use autofocus. On this camera, it's on page seven of the gear icon. So we'll go down to uh, custom key settings here. And what I've done is I've, I've used this button here. And the A6000 does not have that. The A6300 does. It's a really convenient place. You want, you want to be able to hit it with your thumb without having to do any kind of contortion because you're going to be pushing it all the time. And this is literally, it's like the only button that's really convenient to use on these cameras. So I'll scroll down to AF slash MF button and set that to AF on. So now when I want to focus, I just hit that back button. And when I don't want to focus, I just don't do anything, but the camera never focuses without me specifically telling it to. It's incredibly useful. It's going to feel real weird at first, but once you use it five, six times for a couple of days, you, you will never go back. Uh, this camera has, all these cameras have an AF illuminator, which is like an active AF system where it sends out a light when it's having a difficult time focusing. And that can make focusing in low light conditions better. But at the same time, it can also be bad. With, with a lot of lenses, you can see the, the lamp is right there. With a lot of lenses, the lens is going to block the light from hitting the subject anyway. And if you're shooting in a club or a restaurant or something, the light will be bright and distracting and it can completely throw off the whole scene. It can blind people and make them do this. People who, if you're trying to get a candid shot, everybody's going to look around at this bright light that's shining. And, and generally, these cameras do a good job of focusing in low light without that illuminator. So I just turn it off. On, on this particular camera, it's on the camera page here, down on page three. Uh, well, it's on four on this camera. So AF illuminator, auto or off. Um, it's on page three of the A6000's menu. I do a lot to manage the power on these things because the battery life is, is one of the greatest challenges of shooting with Sony gear. They have these, these little tiny batteries. <laughs> no matter which camera it is, they all have the same tiny battery. And so uh, first, I, I own, I think, six or eight batteries and several different chargers, and I'm always kind of switching them through. But I also try to minimize the battery usage. And, and one technique that I found works really well is manual, uh, manually switching the electronic viewfinder. So by default, when you get the camera, it's really convenient. When you hold the camera out, the rear display works. And when you hold it up to your eye, it'll automatically switch. Works great. If battery isn't a concern, then just keep using that. But if you're trying to save some battery power, what will happen is the, the camera will uh, often be switching between the two and it will be running the electronic viewfinder unnecessarily. And um, that can be really frustrating. So I, I prefer to switch it manually. To, to do that, on this camera, it's under wrench seven, page seven, and then the custom key settings. And I, I have it set to C1 up here on the top of the A7R2. You can set it to whichever custom button. And so I'll select that and then set it to finder monitor select. So that will just switch between those two. Next, I need to turn off the automatic finder selection. There we go. So on here, it's on wrench four. And I just need to set it to monitor manual. Actually, I think you need to do that before you set the custom button. And so now it'll automatically, it will, it'll never automatically switch. It'll only manually switch when I do this. 
Now, a, a curious note, people have put a lot of energy into studying the battery consumption on these things. The rear display here uses less power than the electronic viewfinder. You would think the electronic viewfinder would use less power. Um, it uses more, and it, it's actually a little bit nicer. So just keep that in mind. It, it, it's not going to use that much more power if you use the electronic viewfinder all the time, but it'll be nice that it's not automatically turning on for you. Uh, uh, also, another great way to save power is to get in the habit of just turning that off after you take your picture. You're always turning it on. You're always turning it off. If you're coming from the DSLR world, you don't have to do that. You just leave the camera on all the time and your battery lasts for days. On this camera, you really need to shut it down manually. Now let's talk about the electronic front curtain shutter. I did mention that. Um, this is an option on uh, page 5 of the gear menu on this camera. And not all the Sony cameras have the electronic front curtain shutter. But what this does is instead of having a mechanical shutter that flaps on and out, it just it it uses a shutter just like it would during video, where it's just clearing the, the sensor electronically. And that means that it's not reading from the whole sensor all at once. It's kind of doing the like bottom to top thing. And that can lead to rolling shutter where moving subjects might appear a little bit diagonally. That's the downside to the electronic shutter. The upside to the electronic shutter is that the shutter actually shakes the camera. So this is a 42 megapixel camera and I always use sharp lenses on it. So I'm really doing my best to get nice detailed work. And the mechanical shutter will shake the camera enough to, to reduce your image quality. This was a huge problem on the A7R. It was hard to get sharp pictures because of that big flappy mechanical shutter. So I almost always keep the electronic front shutter, shutter curtain turned on. Um, the mechanical shutter will still work at the end, but but then your picture's done, so it's <laughs> it's really not a problem. If you're not if you're shooting action or something, you should probably turn it off. Uh, I'll talk about airplane mode briefly because a lot of people will suggest turning on airplane mode to re reduce the battery usage. Airplane mode basically just permanently kind of shuts off Wi-Fi. But people have done testing on this, and there's no extra power draw when you have, or there's no less power draw when you have airplane mode on. So it doesn't seem to matter. You might as well just leave it turned off. Um, Third-party batteries. Because you end up getting a whole bunch of batteries for your Sony, uh, you might be tempted to buy the much cheaper third-party batteries. And we have had bad luck with those. Um, we've tried several different vendors, and, and what always happens is you get them in, and there's a honeymoon phase when these third-party batteries work fantastically. And that must be the period when people are writing reviews. Because if you go look at like the Wasabi batteries, they get great reviews online. They will work well for maybe it's maybe six weeks, maybe it's a couple of months, maybe it's three months. But at some point, inevitably, the battery life plummets. You'll put it in your in your camera and it might say 100 percent, but then 10 minutes later, it's it's dead and it will just suddenly stop. And um, that is a huge problem, especially if you're shooting professionally and you have a whole shoot planned and then suddenly out of nowhere, your battery stops, screws everything up. So that's unforgivable for me. So for that reason, we we now only buy uh, authentic Sony batteries. I will say the the third party chargers seem to work just fine. So we still use those chargers because we need like a bunch of chargers to keep all of our batteries charging. Um, USB charging can help you out a lot. I always keep a portable USB charger in my my camera bag along with my Sony, along with a USB cable. So I just leave this in my camera bag, and whenever I can, whenever I'm going to not be shooting for a few minutes, I will just plug this right into the port there and um, then hit the button to make sure it's turned on. That will keep the battery charging. That that just keeps it topping off and this has saved my butt a few times. I can also use it to charge my phone which is really helpful. You might need a separate USB cable or maybe not. Anyway, uh, we have like half a dozen of these different USB battery chargers and they're all made by some Chinese company. When you're on YouTube, people just send you USB chargers like all the time. And uh, I've not noticed that anyone is particularly better than any other. They all have that same problem that the generic batteries do where they just die. And like six weeks in, the battery life gets severely diminished. So I can't recommend a specific model. I will say you can ignore the reviews because like I said, there seems to be an effect that uh, people write good reviews before they've actually tested them for a long period of time. Anyway, keep one of those in your bag. It will save your butt. Um, USB charging is also useful when you're traveling. So one of the challenges with traveling is I, I tend to go through three batteries a day with the Sonys. And I will travel with six batteries. Uh, 
so every night when I go back to the hotel, I try to remember to plug the camera and the battery into my computer with a USB cable because my computer will charge it. Then I need to take the other two batteries and I, I usually only travel with like one little charger find a plug in the hotel room, because those are always hard to find, and uh, get that charging. So then I'm charging two batteries. I have to remember at some point to take one of the batteries off and put another one on. If I stumble back maybe a little late and just pass out and I forget to charge those batteries, well, that's why I have six batteries, because I will have three dead batteries. I'll still have three more. There have been times when I will not have any batteries at all because you know you're, you're traveling you might just forget to go through this ritual of, of charging all the batteries and it can be a real problem usb charging can save you anyway i just wanted to point out it's a good thing to to charge your camera with usb overnight even if you also bring a charger because then you can have like two batteries charging at once let's talk about the focusing modes they have a bunch of different focusing modes and and focusing can can also be a challenge on these cameras compared to dslrs which tend to be a little more consistent so we, we very deliberately choose our different focusing modes for things. So I'll select the, the focus area from the function menu here. And by default, your camera will come with the wide focusing area set. And what this does is the camera will just look at the scene and pick the spot for you. And we find that that works 85% of the time, 90% of the time, and then some percent of the time it's gonna just focus on the wrong part of the scene. And you're then left trying to resolve that. Maybe you miss the shot if it's, it's a fleeting moment. So for that reason, for the way I shoot, I tend not to use the wide setting because I need to know that it's going to focus where I want it to. So I tend to prefer to actually select my focusing point just for that 10% of the time when it picks it wrong. The, the center focusing point can work pretty consistently. The center focusing point focuses well on all the cameras. And when you do that, I'll hit the AFON button here, you can then use focus recompose. So if you want to focus off center, you'll focus and then you'll recompose like that. Fortunately, uh, focus recompose works well when you have a lens that doesn't have shallow depth of field. Uh, like if you're just working with the kit lens or something, it should be fine because focus recompose will always move the focal plane a little bit, meaning your focus is always going to be a little bit off, but most of the time it'll just be close enough. When you need to actually move the focusing point around, one of the best things about these Sony's is you can pretty much put the focusing point anywhere you want. So the next option we use, this is what we use almost all the time, is the flexible spot option. And when you select that, you can scroll to the left or right to choose between flexible spot L, M, or S for large, medium, and small. And you definitely want the largest focusing point that will get the job done for you. The smaller focusing points are much less effective. The large focusing point, pretty reliable. The small focusing point in theory should be much more precise, except you're going to see the amount of hunting just like quadruple. You'll find it, it, it will start missing focus more and more and we'll need to hunt all the way in and all the way out and it, it can eventually get there, but it might take a couple of extra seconds. This, again, this depends on what you're shooting. If you're trying to get your kid blowing out their candles, you might find that the camera is hunting the whole time that, that they're blowing out the candles and then it finally locks into focus when the action is done. So you don't want that kind of thing to happen. You kind of have to anticipate it. Bigger focusing points will definitely help you there. Um, if you do use the flexible spot AF like I am and you want to take control of it, you'll end up moving that flexible spot around frequently. And that can be annoying because there's not a, a proper thumbstick like the DSLRs tend to have. So you'll want to assign a shortcut key to it. On this camera, I think I have it set to C2 there. But I will also use like down on the dial on the A6000 or the center point here to change the focusing point, whatever keyboard shortcut feels the most convenient to you. Uh, keep in mind that you'll, the next thing you'll do is you'll have your fingers on the directional pad here. So having it be down on the directional pad kind of makes sense because you can just tap that a couple of times and it will bring it up. So I'll show you how I have it here. So I tap it once and then it pulls that up and then I tap it again. And now I can actually move it around and kind of, uh, pan it around to where I want, and then, you know, hit the center button there to actually choose that as my focusing point. It's still kind of a slow process. I wish they had a touch screen or something, but that's kind of the way you get it done. Now, there are other options for focusing. Uh, these cameras, one of the benefits to having the focusing all on sensor is that it can make very intelligent decisions. It can look for faces and eyes, and it's something a DSLR can't do, and you should take advantage of those features whenever you can. There is face detection AF, and I always turn that on. I also assign a shortcut key to eye detection AF, where it will look for an eye in the scene and actually focus on it. So 
what you'll do there is I, I think I have it set to the center focusing the center button here. But we'll go over to custom key settings, which is on the seventh page of the wrench on this particular camera. And center button here, I have that set to IAF. So when I want to focus on an I, I'll put the face in the scene and then push that IAF button. And hopefully it will find it and lock on. Um, I find that the IAF is it's like 80 <laughs> percent and so that that works well um but if you're actually in a portrait shoot situation and, and you're kind of moving quickly especially models tend to uh move every couple of seconds and, and you develop this kind of rhythm where you shoot they move you shoot they move and that doesn't work well for me with eye detect af because we'll hit four beats and then on the fifth beat it will not work correctly and it will hunt or it simply won't focus on the eye and then we miss our rhythm so it can be a little inconsistent it functions and as long as you're not in a hurry and you can push it a couple of times it's probably going to work um, if there are multiple people in the scene you, you never really know which eye it's going to focus on so in, in those scenarios i end up jumping back to selecting a specific focus point just because that has a, a percentage that's much higher to cl much closer to 100% than I find that the eye detection focuses. Another one of the smart focusing features is the, the lock on autofocus, which is good for tracking action. And uh, basically, you need to enable it. And then when you you would only really use it for action shooting scenarios. And what the lock on AF will do is find your subject. Well, you'll specify a subject by selecting it in the middle of the frame usually and then it will continue to track it as it's moving close or for closer to you or away from you or more specifically around in the around the frame so it will like recognize oh i'm tracking the soccer player here and follow it through the frame um this does work however it the scenario where it's most useful is when the subject is is moving throughout the frame and the camera is mostly stationary and that's just not a shooting scenario that I find all that frequently with sports. So if you are shooting sports and you want to say hold the camera stationary while the subject moves through it, that can work well. Um, I tend to want to keep the subject in like the left third of the frame. So for me, just selecting the focusing point works equally well just for the way that I shoot. However, I do find when I've experimented with lock on AF that it does a great job of following the subject around there are times when suddenly it stops <laughs> and there are times when it will suddenly lock onto the wrong subject and it's some percent of the time maybe it's it's five percent of the time and again I, I tend to get frustrated when the camera makes me miss some sort of shot so i prefer just to kind of tell it what to focus on but that is a, a feature that you should experiment with if it sounds useful to you beeping some people like that audio confirmation that their camera has locked into focus other people hate it. Uh, I hate it, uh, especially because, you know, as a, oh, somebody who shoots weddings, I like things to be quiet and I t get tired of everybody around me making their cameras beep. If you decide you want to turn that off, go over to the toolbox. It's on the first page here, audio signals, and just turn that off. If you ever use adapted lenses or kind of dumb lenses, you want to turn the release without lens setting on. Because the camera with these lenses, it, might, it will think that it doesn't have a lens attached at all and won't let you shoot by default. So go into the menu system. On this particular camera, it's on wrench page four. So go over to the wrenches page four. And here we have release without lens. I'm just going to set that to enable. On that same page is release without card. And I always want to set that to disable because there have been several times when I picked up my camera and I was shooting only to discover that I did not have a card in the camera. So um, a second tip related to that is if you do take the card out of the camera, leave the door open like that. That's the way uh, I always signal that this card, this camera doesn't have a card in it. I never close the door without the memory card in there. That after I've unloaded the card, I'll just put it back in and then close it. But that way, when I go to pick it up, I'll see that it doesn't have a card in it. That has saved me driving off somewhere with my camera and, and no card. Another tip is I like to buy a lot of cheap memory cards, like $10 memory cards, even if they're just 8 gigs. And I'll put one in Chelsea's purse, and I'll put one in the glove box. And, you know, I'll just, like, scatter them <laughs> around my life, wherever I'm going to happen to be. My camera bag, I'll just keep permanently keep an extra card in there. 
That way, when I inevitably do forget my memory card, I can just go like this, and chances are good I've left future Tony a memory card hidden somewhere. I also like to use um, zebras. What, what zebras do is they show you an overexposed part of the picture. So on this camera, the zebra option is the very first option on the, the first page of the wrench menu. And I'll set the zebra option usually to 100. And zebras will highlight parts of the picture that are overexposed. So if I add exposure compensation here, let's see, there must be something I can do to make this thing overexposed. There we go. So you can see some of those lines popping in. There we go. And that, that's just a useful way to see that part of the picture is overexposed. It can be distracting. I have to put this in manual. And it might freak some people out. <laughs> uh, but I, I find it really useful for letting me know that a part of a picture is going to be completely blown out. Conversely, I like to expose to the right to get the picture as bright as I possibly can. So I know if a scene has no zebras in it, then I can add a little more exposure compensation. Another really useful option, an option every camera should have, another option that will save your butt, is reset, resetting the uh, exposure compensation value. This is, on this particular camera, it's on the sixth page of the wrench menu here. And so I'll go down to reset exposure compensation. I set that to reset rather than maintain. It doesn't really matter on this camera because it has a physical dial, but on cameras like the Alpha 6000, where you you might set the exposure compensation and then the next time you go to shoot, you'll forget it and you'll be overexposing your pictures. It can be a lifesaver. It's not that big of a deal when you, as long as you, you have the um, electronic viewfinder just previewing your exposure because at least you'll be able to see it. But it, it, I would, that's a feature that the DSLRs really need more than the mirrorless cameras do. Um, this is going to be specific to the A7R2, but it has an APS-C slash Super 35 mode that for video shooters is incredibly useful. If you're not shooting video, you should just leave this to auto. But we find that the image quality in APS-C mode is about a stop better. It also gives you about a 1.5 crop, so your lens is going to be more telephoto. Uh, if you're okay with that, if you can still work with that focal length, you will actually get better image quality by using a smaller part of the lens here for video. So I'll hit the menu button, and then on the sixth page of the wrench page here, go down to APS-C slash Super 35, and either, either turn it on or off as we need it. I, I try to remember to always go back to off because I like, of course, to use the full sensor when I'm shooting stills. You'll get like 250% more megapixels out of it. Um, but for video, it, it's really useful to be able to turn that on and off. We also use it when we need a little more reach out of whatever lens we're getting at. Uh, I want to go over the apps that I use because the one of the coolest things about the Sony cameras is they do have this app store where you can download new apps. Most of them aren't very good, though. <laughs> uh, so that's the little box icon here. It looks like a grid. I'll select application list. And I, I have tried just about all the apps on different cameras. The only ones I ever actually find practical to use are the, the time lapse app here, which, when you launch it, allows you to do a time lapse. It also allows you to, it doesn't have to be a time lapse. It, it can stitch together a video, but it's useful for just taking 100 pictures in sequence. So it's useful for, say, star trails, or if you're doing self-portraits and you just want to take 100 pictures while you stand there and try different poses out. It's, it's a feature that the camera really should have built into it, and a lot of other cameras do, but at least it's available through an app. I think it's like 10 bucks though. Touchless shutter, I think this one's free, and what this does is it fires the shutter when you wave your hand in front of the viewfinder. And so I was talking earlier about using a delayed shutter to avoid that camera shake when you push it. That's another way to avoid it. Just wave your hand in front of it. It'll take a picture, especially combined with the electronic front sh curtain shutter. It'll give you very, very motionless pictures. And the other app I have here installed is the direct upload app, which will upload pictures from the camera to the PlayStation online social network, which, you know, how popular that is. Um, it'll also upload to Facebook, which, it, it, yeah, so it can put pictures on Facebook for you. Um, it, it can't do like Instagram or Twitter or all these other places. So for that reason, I don't actually find it practical because if I, I don't generally just put things on Facebook, which means if I do want to share a picture, I'm going to get it on my phone so I can share it through multiple apps anyway. It's, it's kind of slow and clumsy. And, you know, you can't do things like tag people on Facebook because it's just not that sophisticated. So 
it's there, but I don't actually find it useful. I'd rather just use Wi-Fi and transfer it over to my phone. This is kind of a physical hack. Um, the record button on these cameras is, sucks a lot. And if, if you shoot a lot of video like I do, you can see it's, it's just kind of recessed and it can just be hard to push deliberately and sometimes you'll push it and you won't know if you pushed it. Anyway, this was a lifesaver. This is a product called Sugru and it's like a little bit of rubber. It's a malleable rubber. So you pull it out, you shape it into a ball and then I just pushed it right on that button there. And we've had that for, I don't know, six months or something. And uh, it's working great. It just, it makes the button easier to find. It makes it easier to push. And I wish Sony would build something like that in. Imagine that, a, a button that poked out a little bit. Seems like something the engineers could do. Another minor physical hack is debadging. And you can see uh, my Sony logo here is pretty much covered up. Uh, I just took a black magic marker and just drew in on the, the Sony logo. And uh, I just don't like advertising a company. And I find, I find the, the design of the cameras to be nice. I just don't like the big, bold logo. So I'll just cover that up. Now, if you go to sell your camera and you think the person might want the actual Sony logo restored, you can just take a Q-tip with some rubbing alcohol and just really, you gotta kinda get in there because it's kind of narrow crevices. Um, but that worked just fine for me to restore it because I, I tested that out. You can undo this with rubbing alcohol just in case you want to. So I look forward to walking around and seeing other people with their debadged Sonys because screw advertising, right? If you use adapted lenses, especially the, can the Canon lenses adapt better than any other lens because the autofocus system seems to just communicate better for whatever reason. So we use a lot of Canon lenses on our Sonys because well, up until this point, the Sony zooms haven't been the best quality. We'll be trying out the G Master lenses this week, but until then, we've been using the Canon lenses with the Metabones Mark IV adapter. There are lots of adapters, uh, some that support autofocus, some that don't. They're all at varying prices, and this is the most expensive of them, the Metabones Mark IV. However, it also works the best. We've tested a bunch out. The, the cheaper ones, the autofocus is pretty unbearable, regardless of the camera. Um, if you have one of the Sony bodies that supports phase detect, like the uh, A7R2 and, and probably the Alpha 6, 6300, we'll test it with the Metabone soon, um, it can make a big difference. It's, it's still not perfect. It will autofocus these, these canning lenses, especially in good light, it can be pretty reliable and pretty consistent. In bad light, it's still going to be kind of frustrating. So we end up still using manual focus a lot, even with the Metabone. So you know, weigh whether or not that being able to use autofocus in good light is worth it to you to spend the extra bucks on this one over one of the, the less expensive uh, adapters. The less expensive adapters work fine just with everything except for autofocus. They'll still give you the, the image stabilization. You'll still be able to control the, the f-stop and such as long as you have autofocus control that is. Um, but the autofocus just won't be reliable. So it might be worth it to spend the extra bucks on the Metabones. If you want more free videos, subscribe to our channel. Three new videos every week. I'd also appreciate it if you gave me a like for these tips and shared it with your friends. Maybe they can find some of these tips useful too. Uh, if you want more tutorials about cameras, go to scp.io slash tutorials. We'll just walk you through the important features of the cameras for just about every modern camera. So you can share that with people who have other types of cameras as well, Sony cameras. And of course, all the important stuff is not covered here. It's stuff like mood, expression, storytelling, composition, the art of photography. We cover that in our book, Stunning Digital Photography, which is more than a book, has 12 hours of video, online groups that can help you out, quizzes, everything you might want. And if you're not happy with it, I will personally give you your money back. Just send me an email. You can pick it up at Amazon or you can visit our store at sdp.io slash store. The eBooks are only 10 bucks. We ship the paperback books worldwide if you want. If you're into Photoshop or Lightroom, we have books on those. Check it out at the same place. I also have a book all about buying gear in case you're interested in knowing how to save some money, getting the best lenses and such. Thanks.